Welcome to the GSD Factor podcast with your host, Misha Blamire Farish. On today's episode, I am excited to have Anthony Beckett, a high school senior here in Williamson County, who is also a part of the Williamson County Entrepreneur and Innovation Center program. Today's episode is a GSD Get Stuff Done. So make sure that you are grabbing your teens and your young adults that want to hear Anthony's amazing entrepreneurial story. Anthony, thank you so much for being with us today. I am so happy to be here and be important enough to be considered for this. (laughs) Well, Anthony, you are important and we are so excited to introduce you to the world, especially the GSD Factor world And I really am excited that we're going to share your story, both your entrepreneurial story, because I think it's really important to invest in the next generation. Um, And as a mentor, as part as a mentor at the EIC now, I am so excited to be able to have you on here. And we'll be talking and sharing your story around how your entrepreneurial journey has gone, how you have um, been doing a lot of pitches, how you won the most recent pitch competition, which is actually where I got to hear you in action. Um, And I'm really excited to for us to follow on your journey and hear about what's next after graduation this May. Sounds good. I love the books. I love the community, the GSD community, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. So that's great. So Anthony, give um give our listeners a little bit of a background about yourself, and um you know tell us a little bit about your story up to this point. Yeah. So I think the first thing that you really have to understand, especially meeting me, is I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. So all the years back when I started high school, I was coming in as a freshman. I just thought, you know, I like coding some. I'm going to go be some software engineer. Why would I want to start a business or do anything like that? And that's really where I was that whole freshman and most of my sophomore year was I was just thinking, I want to code. But then, you know, problems struck, I guess, with classes. I'd been working on some websites in the past. And as time went on, I kind of started considering and going, you know, is entrepreneurship something I wanted to look at? But I think the thing you got to keep in mind is when I started this ed tech venture, if you will, I did not want to be an entrepreneur. And it started out as just a basic tool. And so, you know, looking back over two years now to when the project Markify started, I was sitting in my math class. The teacher was up at the front of the room writing these notes down on the board. And all of us students would copy them down onto our sheet. But uh, problem struck when the teacher erased that board before I had written everything down. And I started thinking over 60% of schools in the United States have a one-to-one computer program, including the one that I go to. So why not, and one-to-one meaning that every student has a computer. So why not take what the teacher's writing at the board and stream it real time to all the students' computers like mine so I can see it up close. And I started work on that project, spent about six months developing it at the start, thinking that it was going to come out. It's going to be the biggest ed- educational tool ever. Um, and obviously that didn't happen, but I learned a lot during that process. And as time went on, I started going, you know, is this something that would be worth turning into a business? And I think as time went on too, I realized I didn't like coding eight hours a day. And as the product became to come out and I realized how much I liked the marketing aspect of it, I even liked kind of coming up with the sales aspect, some in, in presentations, I started going, is this something that would be worth starting a business? And that's why senior year of high school, I decided I would do the EIC. And the senior year is the only year that I've done the Entrepreneurship Innovation Center in Williamson County. Prior to that, I just did Brentwood High School. I hadn't thought of coming to the EIC, but senior year, I thought, well, this entrepreneurship is something I'm interested in. I might as well give it a shot, you know, and um, quite a few teachers have told me about it and suggested it. So I did it. And it was by far the best decision I made in my whole high school career was coming to this place and they were finally able, they saw the vision, they saw the idea of it. They were able to get me in front of the people that, you know, got it approved, got it looked at in schools. And that's really where it started catapulting off. And then here we are over 50 teachers using it, um, quite a big product and it's growing every day. You know, I saw 10 new teachers start using it really in the past week. So I guess we'll see where it goes in the future, but that's kind of my backstory and what that really looks like. So, so many un- amazing nuggets to unfold there, Anthony. And I think what I want to start with is I appreciate your transparency around, I didn't want to start off as an entrepreneur. That wasn't my intention. It wasn't the plan. 
So maybe talk us through a little bit of that mindset that you had, right? As you're going into, as you're starting your high school career, right? As a ninth grader and a 10th grader, and as you're going through all this, maybe talk, you know, talk to our listeners about what was that like to say, you know, I was going down a path, but then I pivoted and I wasn't thinking entrepreneur, but then I shifted and pivoted again. So talk us through that mindset. So, you know, my whole life is, I like to say that my whole life is pivots, really. I mean, even going back in the middle school, you know, what, what surprises a lot of people is that I actually hated coding most of my life. I hated programming. I thought programming, that's something that's just on a computer that, you know, nobody sees physically. I want to engineer real things I can hold, right, or see. Uh, I'd always been interested in technology, though, was really that core interest. And so, you know, going back when I was three years old, I would take laundry baskets and I'd flip them over, I'd put toys underneath and call it an air conditioner. And for really the first four or five years of my life, I was thinking about, oh, I want to grow up and be an air conditioning repairman. And I actually went in the kindergarten and I know that you, that classic thing where, um, you know, they're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the teacher's like, Anthony, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm like, oh, I want to repair air conditioners. And I would say everyone else is like, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a police officer. I'm just like, I want to repair air conditioners. Um, but as time went on, it went from air conditioners to doorknobs to outlets to everything else. And like I said, really going up to middle school, I hated the idea of programming. I didn't see the point of it. But eventually, my mom signed me up for a programming class. And it's like, Anthony, you're going to try coding. I think you're going to like it. I'm like, no, I don't like it. And she's like, nope, you're going to do it. So I did that week of programming, came through it. And well, what do you know? I absolutely loved it. And so I really liked it. Uh, at first, I made games. And I think the, the core thing to remember is that you can only kind of look back on your past to connect the dots, to see where you're where you're going. You can't look into the future and predict what you're going to do then. Or you can predict it, but you can't necessarily, that's not what's going to come true. And so, you know, looking back at when I made these games at the time, I thought, oh, I'm going to make video games for like the next 30 years. But, you know, the problem is I suck at art. Video games require a lot of art. But I made multiplayer games, and these multiplayer games had a lot of infrastructure to make it where, you know, people's computers connect and they can play together. And that is what winded up sticking with me. So I spent really the rest of my middle school doing video game programming just on the side. I made some video games. I've actually peaked at over 300 players during that time. So I had some success with that, but it was something that as time went on, I realized, you know, I don't want to do video games my whole life. It's something that I'm interested in some of the aspects. And I think that's the real takeaway is that everything you do, maybe you don't love it. Maybe it's not your favorite thing, but there's always something you can learn and take away from it to go into your next project and always, always keep moving. Never settle in with the current thing that you're doing. I took these video games going into high school and I'm like, all right, I learned a lot about multiplayer, but I didn't really like you know, artwork designing this game. And so I started a new website freshman year and it was actually my first website, not like a game, but an actual web app. Uh, it was called Photop and it was essentially a social media platform, which always makes people laugh because it's like a complete 180 degree shift from the education technology I went into next, you know, social media and education software is polar opposites. But I made this website called Photop and it really, similar to Markify, started as an accident. I'd started it as a coding project, but um, winded up publishing it just because why not? It was like a week-long coding project, thought might as, might as well publish it. And it winded up having quite a bit of success. It had like over 2,000 people sign up. And I just thought, oh, well, I better run with this. And so that's really what I did freshman year. And the important thing to realize with Photop is that is when I realized what I was interested in. It was web development. It was developing tools that people use. And this social media Photop also leverage that real-time multiplayer infrastructure because it was a chat application. And so think of something like iMessage, but it's public and people are chatting back and forth with each other in real time on this website. And that's where I've really continued building out that real-time infrastructure. But then about halfway through my sophomore year, like I said, that's when I had the problem with Markify. I'd also, since I'd been developing Photop so long, I was kind of tired of it. I wanted a new project. And I should also mention that I had always, always, always not liked education software. I thought it just was clunky, hard to use, annoying. And so that's when I thought then, all right, let's pivot again. So first I pivoted from games 
or really first I pivoted from non-software into games. Then I pivoted from games into web development, but with social media. And then I pivoted from social media in the education technology because I realized this was something I'm very interested in. How can I incorporate that real-time infrastructure and multiplayer in the my education software? And then that's kind of when the bell went off in my head because wait a minute, the product I want to make takes takes the teacher screen and streams it real time to all the students. There you go. And all of those keys aligned, if you will, everything from the game development where I learned about multiplayer to this chat application that had to support hundreds of people chatting with each other. I took all of that know-how and built, baked it all in the market buy. And it's the only reason it's how it's as reliable as it is today and not crashing on teachers or as clunky as other software. I really love what you share, Anthony, because I think the takeaways from that are as you are walking that journey, you're taking those nuggets and those and those pieces with you every step of the way. And if you hadn't had those previous experiences and if you hadn't had those pivots, Markify wouldn't be what it is today. Talk to us about when you are looking at the world, right? Whether it's you're looking at the work that you're doing as an entrepreneur, whether you're looking at, you know, the work that you're doing in education as a student, talk about when you see a problem and you start thinking about what is the solution to that problem? And can I come up with that solution? Talk about that mindset. Well, I think the big thing is, and maybe it's a bit of a personal problem, actually, but everything I look at, I can start recognizing problems. I mean, it almost becomes annoying because I'm so much of a perfectionist. I mean, I look at everything and I just want it to be perfect. I'm, I mean, I'm looking at a chair right now next to me and I'm like, how could I make that better? You know, I'm looking like, well, it's annoying how the armrest is positioned on it and everything there. And so I think the, the thing to realize what the problem is, stop looking at it like it's a problem and look at it like it's something that annoys you and that if only this thing was, you know, didn't annoy me as much. And then you realize, oh, wait, I can take that thing that annoys me, make that a problem and start looking for solutions. And so the problem's never been that hard for me. I mean, I have a line of problems other than Markify that I wish I could solve. What's always hard for me is picking one of those problems and actually homing down, picking one, and then spending the two years it takes to make the solution. Because I might see a thousand problems in a day, but I don't have the time to fix all thousand of them, obviously. And so, you know, I still don't think I found the perfect solution for narrowing down problems by any means. But what I've really come to is taking that problem that I have and deciding if it's something that I can realistically solve is what I've always looked at. And like with Markify, like I said, I had developed real-time infrastructure for years. I had knowledge on the web. It would have been foolish if I had never coded and I just sat down one day and went, you know, I'm going to solve that problem of how do I get the notes down on my paper? You know, it it would never have worked. And so I had to sit down and go, you know what? That's a problem. And not only is it a problem, it's something I have the resources to solve and make better than what's currently done. And so that's kind of the first half of it. The other half is really confirming with other people and talking with other people. So when I had the idea for Markify, I actually spent a whole month. I made a rule. I told myself, one rule, you have to wait one month before you can start any coding. And it was a hard, it was a hard thing because I was, I, when I had that idea, and like I said, it's like a light bulb went off. I wanted to just start coding away, code all through the night, code a week straight. And, but I told myself, no, you have to go talk to teachers and see if that's actually a problem they have. And that was also one of the best decisions I probably ever made because What I learned, and if I hadn't done that, would have gone down this whole path, is that teachers thought it was a problem, but it wasn't a big enough problem that they wanted to learn a new piece of tech to fix it. And what I really learned at the end of that month, I talked to over 30 teachers during it. What I learned is they what they really wanted was to look at the student, the student facilitation and be be, them themselves become the facilitator. They want students to teach other students. And then teachers sitting back, controlling it, making sure everyone's in the right direction. Um, But it's more of the students having the baton. It's the teacher passing that baton to the students. So instead of my scenario where the math teachers up at the front writing notes that we all copy down, instead of that, it's students writing notes that other students are taking down. And like I said, the math teachers up at the front making sure everyone's on track. And once I realized that that's really what teachers wanted, that's really what the problem was 
that's when Markify really started to go in the right direction. And if I hadn't done that, I would have built out a whole thing that nobody would have liked or used. And that comes down to a whole other point, which is that not all problems need a solution necessarily. There's so many problems that maybe you want to solve, but it, you know what's out there works and people aren't wanting to learn something new. You've got to figure out what do people want. And so that that's really how I look at problems and solutions, I guess, as you could say. Well, and I think what's so important about that is, first of all, you know, certainly wisdom beyond your years, right? Because I think so many times entrepreneurs, problem solutionists get out there and say, oh, this is the problem I'm going to solve. But they forget that first step of asking the questions. They forget that that next step of um, customer discovery and, and customer inquiry and saying, who are the individuals that would be using this product? Would they like to change um, what is that? What are truly their pain points? Because as you said, you may think it's a pain point, but the users of that product may not think it's a is is a um, pain point. And I think so many times companies do all this work, put all this time, these resources into these products or these tools or these solutions, but they forgot that very first step of ask, actually pausing or what I like to say, slowing down to speed up to say, hey. Have we actually asked the people that would use this? Have we paused to have questions, asked the questions? Have we been curious? And what was really cool with what you've shared is how it leads into one of our GSD factor attributes of being inquisitive. And I think, you know, I think let's let your our listeners hear from you about how do you really exercise that being inquisitive muscle? And you've already given us a view of a view of it, but talk to us a little bit more about how are you curious? And I think, you know, for those of us who love Ted Lasso, right? It's that whole idea of be curious and not judgmental. But how are we asking those questions and inquiring, especially when we're problem solving? Well, I think, and also not just on that, but going back to what you were saying a little bit about people not asking the questions, you know, I've, I've talked to hundreds at this point of mentors, entrepreneurs, you know, I think that the first thing you have to do to really be inquisitive, as the factor says, is you have to go out and find people. People aren't going to come to you, right? You're not just going to sit in a room and mentor and all these really smart experts aren't just going to walk up to you and go, hey, here's some good advice you're going to have to go out to them. And so i that's the first thing I've done. And I've gone out to, like I said, hundreds of people at this point, probably even more. I've sent so many emails to people and sure 99% of the time, no one responds, but the 1% of the time they do, they might offer that life-changing advice um, in, in, you know, solve the issue that you're having. And so I really look at that. Now, of those hundreds of people, there is a good number of people, you know, I like to say that all advice is good but not all advice is helpful. And so um, you have to be able to run that through the filter, essentially, and kind of go, all right, you know, is that good advice? Is that something that I need to listen to? Or is that something that I can learn from, but not necessarily do and run my business into the ground? Um, and so much of the time, so many of the people I've talked to, because I think everybody, everybody from someone that's a multi-billionaire to even someone that might be on the side of the street, you know, everyone has some kind of advice to give you. Um, but of those people that have launched businesses, and I even have quite a few in my family that have failed to launch businesses um, that I've talked to, and what almost always seems to happen is kind of going back to what you're talking about with the problem and people not asking the questions and asking people if that's a problem and, and understanding that. What I see all the time is that people think that entrepreneurship is this magical thing where you get to be your own boss, right? Everyone's like, oh, entrepreneurship, I can do my own hours. I can do everything how I want to do it. And, you know, I'm, I'm my own boss. I don't have that person above me that I have to listen to. But the thing that's so hard, and I had to realize it when I started thinking about doing entrepreneurship or even really before I had decided that it was a path I was looking at, is that, well, what happens when you're an entrepreneur is everybody becomes your boss. And so now I have to deal with everyone. Um, and that's, it's all, obviously it's impossible to please everyone. But I think that's the first thing but being inquisitive that I had to realize was that, hey, I'm not the boss. The thousands, tens of thousands, hundred thousand teachers out there are the boss that I have to listen to. And, you know, the thing that's also hard with me being an 18 year old um, or literally turned 18 five days ago um, is that 
you know, I don't know anything about education. I'm not a teacher. I don't have a teaching degree. I also haven't worked in IT, right? I, I don't know how school districts or organizations manage their internet technology and do all that. And so if I made my, if I made Markify or even anything else and I wasn't going out to them and listening and making sure I did it right. I mean, when I came to do Markify, it was a 10 plus page form to fill out that if I didn't fill that out properly, Markify would have never gotten approved because these school districts have to cover their butt. Essentially, they have to be ensuring that they can't get sued. And they want to know things like, well, where is your data being stored? How is it being encrypted? What do you collect? And if I hadn't gone out to people and asked, gone out to those experts that do know all of that and do deal with that on a daily basis, well, I think it's safe to say Markify would still be a project in my bedroom, right? It wouldn't be something that anybody's using because I'm not doing any of the things I have to do. And that's what I'm saying. I'm not an expert in anything except being able to find experts. It's kind of like what I like to say. I don't know anything other than going to find those people that do know that. And maybe one day in 20 years later, I can cross my fingers and maybe be able to call myself an expert in something after talking to thousands of those people. Um, but that's kind of how I, how I really look at being inquisitive is, is recognizing that, you know, to put it bluntly, recognizing that you're an idiot and that you need to find other people that aren't an idiot and, and get the advice, get what they have and really just get their idea. And like I said, even people that might not know anything are going to know something. And, and that's kind of been a hard lesson that I've learned in the past because I used to just write people off. I'd be like, yep, they don't know what they're talking about. And then it happened that I learned my lesson and had to you know waste a month of time if I had just listened to them before. So it's it's definitely something to, to look out for, I think, as an entrepreneur. Really arrogance, too, is what it feeds into. So it's definitely something to be careful with. I think, too, when you are being inquisitive, right, it's that art of, you know, constantly learning, learning something from everything, right, whether it's what to do or what not to do, but also understanding and recognizing I'm not the smartest person in the room, but I know how to mobilize and I know how to find the people that can come alongside me. And we talk about in the GSD Factor life of having two groups of people. You have your GSD Factor clan, which is that more of that personal kind of group in your life that you can talk to. And there could be that spiritual person. There could be that physical, you know, that kind of um, healthy physical mentor or um, there's those different people that have those different places in your life. And then on the professional side, you have what we call the GST Factor Insiders Board. And with that, it could be your visionary member. It could be your spiritual member. It could be your um, data member, your technology member, all those different things. And if we live this life of open hands, the right people are going to flow in and the right people are going to flow out. And that will change over time as, you know, as you are growing as an individual, as your business is growing as an individual and being and knowing when you need to change those people in your life or knowing when you need to go out and get new people for both your personal clan, but also your professional insiders board is really, you know, is really important. And I think it's really smart, especially as you are embarking on your entrepreneurial journey, whether you're 18 or, you know, 38 or 58, even right entrepreneurs, you can start at any age. And I think that those are really great insights um, that I think our listeners will really resonate with. So um, Anthony, for this year, our theme is asking individuals, what are you powerfully choosing for yourself in 2024? Well, I've, I've thought a lot about this question and, you know, it's really hard, especially just narrowing it down to one thing. Now, the hardest thing for me, and it, it's something that every day I seem to conflict with an opinion on it, um, but it's the fact that I'm still in school. And, you know, college would start next year. And what's been so, just so hard to get over, you know, I've, I've met with several different investor groups of people that have been interested. I wouldn't say anything's on the table, but it's kind of sitting by the table that they're interested in looking into it. Um, but all those groups have said that if they were to put any amount of money into it, they don't want me leaving anywhere to go to college. And it has been a very, very hard thing for me to, to figure out and think and I'm talking with parents and things because especially my mom used to be very much a, 
you know, school's the only thing that matters. Shut down, mark buy. You know, it's don't worry about it. And for a long time, that is what I, I did. You know, I worked on it on the side, but it wasn't something I put over school. But now I'm having so many meetings and, and interviews, frankly, um, that is it's impossible to manage both. And so what I, I feel like I've been powerfully choosing so far 2024 and what I don't have any plan stopping is choosing Markify, right? And choosing this endeavor going, I'm a young person. Why not give it a shot now? It's just going to get harder as life goes on. And so, you know, we'll see what happens with college, but, you know, I can't just put over 10,000 hours in the Markify to just go, oh, well, I need to do college. So let's shut it down and go do that because everyone does that. And so, but it's, it's definitely been a hard thing going back and forth to really figure out, do I want to choose Markify? Is it something that I believe in so much? Is it something that I believe could get to the point that at least sustain me in life, you know, to pay for a small apartment or something? Is it something that can do that? You know, is choosing Markify the right path over choosing, you know, grades, extracurriculars, I mean, I used to be on on Robotics Club and Science Olympiad, but I just don't have the time anymore. And so, but the thing I've learned is that the worst thing you can do, even worse than picking the, you know, quote unquote, wrong option. I mean, there's not really a wrong option with Markify or school, but the one thing worse would be bouncing between them because then you destroy both of them. And so I've just decided at this point, really in the past few days, Markify is what I'm choosing. If, you know, my business is what I'm choosing and fingers crossed, I don't go to regret it. If I have to get a job at McDonald's in the future, well, I'll probably rewatch this interview and laugh. But, you know, um, I, I think at the end of the day, you've just got to believe in yourself enough and believe what you're doing and, and go, all right, it's time for a leap of faith, right? It's time to just go full into it and run off with it and see what happens because life's short, right? And I, even though I'm only 18, I regularly have thoughts about, you know, if I was 70, 80 years old and died the next day, would I be happy with what I'm doing, you know, this month, this year? Would I be happy with that? And when you look at something like school or college, the answer would be no. I don't think I would. I would want to be off doing my own project. I think what's really important is for those of our listeners who are, you know, coming to that decision point, right? Do they go down the path of college? Do they go down a vocation? Do they go down, you know, maybe they are an entrepreneur and they're wanting to explore those things. I think, you know, what our society provides for today is that you have more opportunities to be able to do um, those journeys, right? And for me, I'm not a college graduate. I was going off on my own entrepreneurial journey post high school as well by co-founding a dance school with another family. And that was really important to me and, and being able to have that school and teaching and dancing. Um, and then my life has ha also had its pivots. And so I started with some college and doing some classes online, but you know, pivot after pivot after pivot turned into 20 years in the technology and insurance space for me. And so, you know, now at this stage in my life, I'm an I'm a entrepreneur again with multiple companies. And I think what's really important is for, you know, for both parents and, and kids to understand that there are lots of options out there and to not feel like you have to go down one path versus another path and being open minded to what that is and dreaming big about what is that right path for yourself. Um, I think is really important. And so I'm so glad that you shared that with us because I think that that's really, you know, that is a really important lesson for 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 those families that may be working through that with their own with their own seniors that are coming. I just want to say for the moms that are frowning right now as they're listening to this talk about riding off college or something, please keep in mind, I'm I'm first of all, I'm not endorsing. Second of all, um, I do just want to say that regardless of what happens, I'm still going to go to some college. Maybe it's online school. Maybe it's something more local instead of the top of the top. Um, but I think the important thing is figuring out your passion, because the sooner you can figure out what you do want to do in life or your kid figures it out, that's when they're, the puzzle pieces are going to come together and they're going to figure out, all right, you know, not just long term, but, you know, this is what I want to do. So these are the good colleges to go to. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with college. Everyone I know is going through college. And so I'm still going to do that. But it's it's thinking about 
okay, it's no longer about how is college going to help me? It's about how is college going to help Markify? And it's realizing that you've got to take the resources, the assets that you have and focus that in onto what your project is or what you're working on or really what your life's work has led up to. And I think that you always have to realize that the option to pivot is there. Rather, you're 10 years old, like me going from an outlet to a doorknob or, or you're going or you're 50 years old that have been working an office job for 30 years and you're thinking about, you know, should I live out the rest of my life really starting and running this business that I've had an idea and wanted to do for 10 years, right? It's figuring out you can always pivot and everything you've done before you can help to leverage and catapult what you want to do next. Thank you, Anthony. So Anthony, how do people get in touch with you? A, to just, you know, be able to connect with you, but also, you know, maybe we're talking, maybe we have teachers that are listening in and are really interested in trying Markify. What is the best way for individuals to get in touch with you? Yeah. So the best way to get in touch with me would have to be email or LinkedIn. And so my email, and I'm sure this will be linked below, but uh, my email is abeckett at exotech.co. And then LinkedIn's just Anthony Beckett. You should be able to just search that up and find it. Um, If you wanted to type it in the URL bar, it'd be Beckett-Anthony. Now, if you're at all interested in Markify, even if you're not, and you know someone that might be interested, I know everybody out there listening to this knows at least that one person that's crazy enough to want to be a teacher. If you could just head to markifyapp.com markifyapp.com and join the wait list or send it to someone. Um, I'm going through that wait list right now and letting people on. And so please, please, you know, and I know any teachers listening to this are definitely going, I don't want to learn a new software. It is the easiest thing. And you can adapt any lesson that you're using right now to work with Markify. You don't need to reinvent the wheel to try it out. And I'm just trying to get feedback. You know, if you try it out, shoot me an email, let me know. So I'm really open on any of that. The last thing I'll say is that if you want to kind of follow my progress, see where this goes, see if it goes up, flying, soaring in the air, or runs straight into the ground, into the grave, um, you can go to Twitter. uh, And my Twitter is Markify Tool. And so at Markify Tool, or I guess X is what I should be saying. Um, But you'll see all of that. uh, And I make posts pretty regularly about what's going on with it and where it's at. And so I would appreciate your support on any of those platforms. Amazing. Anthony, thank you so much for coming on the GSD Factor. Thank you for sharing your story. We're excited to follow you on your entrepreneurial journey. We're excited to see where Markify goes. We'll be sharing all of the links that you talked about with our viewers in the show notes. And to our GSD Factor listeners, you know, we are, we hope that this has ignited that excitement for you, a transformation for you, whether it's for yourself or for your um, own kids. And um, don't forget to get stuff done. Thanks for listening to the GSD Factor podcast. If you liked this episode, please rate and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, where you can also find previous episodes. Let's also connect on LinkedIn and Instagram. If you're looking for more information on the GSD Factor, visit us at gsdfactor.com.